Welcome, distinguished guests, students, members of the public. Uh, and on behalf of everyone, I would like to extend also a warm welcome to the President of the International Criminal Court, Silvia Fernandez de Gormendi. Welcome to our symposium on African justice mechanisms and their interplay with the International Criminal Court, co-organized by the African Group for Justice and Accountability, the Vayamo Foundation, and hosted by the Faculty of Law of the University of Cape Town. Um, today's event would not have been possible without the generous support of our funders, who are the four ministries of Switzerland, and we have two representatives with us, um, the United Kingdom, um, where we also have a representative here, uh, Germany, the Netherlands, and Finland. Um, thank you as very much uh, to host us, University of Cape Town, to Penelope Andrews, um, the Dean of the Faculty of Law, and Hannah Wulliver, thank you very much to help um, organizing this event. Um, we hope that this is the beginning of a, a cooperation. Um, you know, we already all fell in love with your university um, and hope to continue that, um, organize more events. Um, last but not least, um, thank you to Vayamo, to um, my team, uh, Kojo, Chris, Mark, Mike, and Judy. Um, I know that the last days have been a little bit stressful, but thank you also for bearing with me sometimes. Um, it is a distinct privilege uh, for me to briefly introduce the 12 members of the Africa Group for Justice and Accountability. We have now 12 members, eight members are present. Um, Dapo Akande, uh, Professor of Public International Law, University of Oxford, he will arrive tomorrow. Femi Falana, who is with us, um, human rights activist and lawyer from Nigeria. Um, Hassan Bubakar Jallo, a former prosecutor at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals. Um, unfortunately, he couldn't be with us. Uh, Richard Goldstone, former chief prosecutor of the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia. Um, Tija Maluva from Malawi, who is here with us from the Ladies Montag Chair in Law, Pennsylvania State University School of Law. Um, Atalia Molokome, the Attorney General of Botswana. Uh, Betty Murungi from Kenya, who unfortunately couldn't come. Independent consultant on human rights and transitional justice. Mohamed Shande Otman from Tanzania, Chief Justice of Tanzania. Navi Pile, sitting with us here, former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, then one of the new members, uh, Catherine Samba Panza, who is the uh, Central African, the President of the Central African Republic. Until I think today, tomorrow, there's uh, the handover. Um, 25th. 25th, yeah. Um, and Fatia Serur, from, originally from Algeria, director of Serur Associates for Inclusion and Equity, and Abdul Tejan Cole, who's with us too, from Sierra Leone, executive director of the Open Society uh, Initiative for West, West Africa. In November 2015, the Africa Group for Justice and Accountability came together as an, as you already mentioned, independent body to support justice and accountability efforts in Africa and elsewhere in the world. When we launched this initiative at the ASP in The Hague of last year, we decided to have biannual meetings, and this here in Cape Town is our first biannual meeting. Um, we decided that our first public activities um, would consist of capacity building and a needs assessment. Uh, second, then we had a second strategic meeting of the members of the group yesterday and the public symposium we are starting today. Uh, we had already a successful first meeting um, three days ago with directors for public prosecution, special prosecutors and special prosecutors from the continent, participants from the ICC and international organizations. A few of the participants of the first event are still with us today. Uh, we del deliberated and discussed how to strengthen domestic capacity in prosecuting international and transnational crimes in collaboration with relevant international actors. And we will come up with a report about these events and develop our next capacity building measures based on that needs assessment and on that first meeting we did. This reflects the mission of the Africa Group for Justice and Accountability, which is 
more specifically, and I will read from our mission statement, to strengthen justice and accountability measures in Africa through domestic and regional capacity building, advice and outreach, and enhancing cooperation between Africa and the International Criminal Court. And with that, I would like to hand over to our actual representative, Navi Pillay, um, who will speak on behalf of the group. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good morning, er everyone. I'm very pleased to have the Vice Chancellor and the President of the ICC, but most importantly, your presence, which I will come back to just now. I've been uh, have the privilege to deliver a statement on behalf of the members, the 12 members of the uh, group. The Africa Group for Justice and Accountability uh, is an independent group of senior African experts on international criminal law and human rights law, including political figures, members of international and domestic tribunals, and human rights advocates. We came together, as Bettina said, in November 2015 to contribute towards strengthening justice and accountability in Africa. The Africa Group for Justice and Accountability firmly believes that justice and accountability on the African continent, as well as elsewhere, is better served by positive engagement with and membership in the International Criminal Court. We believe that certain issues that have adversely affected the relationship between the court and some African governments can be resolved. Relevant parties can and should manage such issues by cooperating and engaging meaningfully as state parties to the Rome Statute. The African Group encourages justice and accountability on the African continent, and we encourage this globally. We chose to focus on Africa because we, are, we come from Africa and this is our priority. We hope soon that there will be other movements such as this in other regions and that we will be um, an initiator and an example to those groups. We champion a transparent and productive dialogue between relevant stakeholders and the ICC. Accordingly, we will continue to encourage, support, and foster an open debate on the relationship between the ICC, Africa, and beyond. And as Bettina said, this is our second meeting. We consolidated the membership between the first and second. This is our very, very important a gathering for the members of uh, the Africa Group for Justice and Accountability because we need to answer how we are going to go about this mandate, what kind of activities, ideas, what are the issues we should be watching out for. And you are the experts, you, are, you do hands-on work where it matters on the ground. So we uh, look forward to the discussions and the six panels. Uh, thank you for your presence on behalf of uh, the ICJA members. Thank you very much, Ms. Pelle. Um, it's now time for our keynote uh, address, and that will be delivered by Judge Sylvia Fernandez de Gumandi, President of the International Criminal Court. Thank you. Um, if you don't mind, I will stay here, half hidden by my flowers and with my... Flowers. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> that was the idea, to be <laughs> half hidden. <laughs> um, good morning to you all. It's really a great pleasure for me to, to be here. And uh, I would like to, to thank the Africa Group for Justice and Accountability 
and the director of the Wayamo Foundation, Bettina Ambach, for extending this invitation uh, for, to me to participate in this extremely pertinent and timely symposium on African justice mechanisms and their interplay with the ICC. Um, I will come back to, 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 the, to the group, and I have heard the, uh, the statement, a uh, very, uh, very important statement, very, very carefully. Uh, but I would like to uh, congratulate the group already for their first very wise decision, that is to hold their first meeting in this wonderful, beautiful University of Cape Town. It is really, for me, a pleasure to be here. And uh, I really like this part of the protocol where you give me a gift, and I really like the flowers. So uh, thank you very much, and I'm very impressed by the, uh, by the program of, uh, for, the next, uh, for the next three days, which contain an impressive array of topics, uh, such as the relations between the ICC and Africa, uh, issues on international crimes and transnational crimes, human rights, the role of NGOs and the very important and contentious issues of immunity of head of states, among others. Uh, not all these topics are uh, directly related to the ICC, of course, but they are all extremely relevant for the court that I have the pleasure to represent here today, and more generally to an interdependent system uh, of the rule of law. Indeed, I think we all increasingly recognize that national, regional, and international courts are all part of a broad system of global justice. And uh, of course, the International Criminal Court is, uh, is an important part of this system uh, because we are indeed a last resort court. So the court is designed to complement uh, and not to replace national systems when uh, and we, we are intend, expected to do so only when they fail to address crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity, or war crimes. And even, even when the court uh, decides to intervene uh, because the, uh, there is a failure of, of national action for any uh, reason, then even then the ICC will only focus on a limited number of uh, alleged perpetrators those most responsible for such crimes. And only then we will address a limited part of the universe of crimes that may be committed in a given situation. So it is therefore clear that to seriously address mass atrocity crimes, there must be a unified, comprehensive response through judicial and other methods backed uh, by strong political will to ensure accountability. And the court can only do a part of that. Uh, and of course, all this cannot happen unless national, regional, and international actors alike are determined in their commitment to the rule of law, human rights, and justice. As I said before, the International Criminal Court has not uh, been created to replace domestic tribunals. These tribunals, continue to be at the forefront of the battle. Even in today's globalized world, national institutions carry the primary responsibility for addressing human rights violations and international crimes. However, they are not alone in facing this task. The Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court embodies this shared responsibility of the international community for addressing core international crimes. And time and again, the Assembly of State Parties to the Rome Statute has also expressive, expressed its commitment to support the strengthening of national jurisdictions. So, and in order this, for this complementary system to work, it is important for all these, uh, uh, for the international community to help in strengthening national uh, systems and for the court to do its own work as a last resort institution where this national capacity is not uh, able to deal with the matters. Um, much has been said and probably more will be said in the, uh, in the coming days about this concept of positive complementarity. 
uh, and uh, which is indeed this idea of uh, uh, addressing the core crimes by strengthening national jurisdictions. Of course, this is something for the international community to, uh, to help to do, to strengthen, and uh, I'm very happy to, uh, to see also the African group on accountability dealing with, uh, with, um, with these issues and bringing initiatives on how to deal with this matter. The court can do only uh, a limited part of that, uh, maybe sharing our experiences uh, and, uh, and maybe also helping to understand in which areas some strengthening is needed. But of course, it is not the, the court's mandate in itself to do this part of the work. But this is an extremely uh, important uh, part of the system. Now, when, we, when the court does what it's called the preliminary examinations, which is before the investigations take place, that is a, a, an area where lots can be done and discussed about how to strengthen the national system in order to avoid that the ICC uh, needs to open an investigation. And actually, it is a, a window of opportunity to discuss in very concrete ways what can and should be done at the national level. Let me remind you that the uh, court uh, has opened uh, a number of investigations, now actually in 10 situations, but um, at, the, at this moment, the Office of the Prosecutor is also conducting preliminary examinations in the situations of Af Afghanistan, Colombia, Guinea, Iraq, Nigeria, Palestine, and Ukraine. These are uh, situations that have been made public by uh, the prosecutor. And, uh, in, some of, and, and, and in, that, in some of these situations, the Office of the Prosecutor has engaged in some positive complementarity uh, with, uh, with, uh, the, some can, with the countries concerned. For instance, in Guinea, the prosecutor and her staff have engaged extensively with the national authorities with a view to supporting national justice efforts. And the prosecutor reported last year that, and I quote the prosecutor, concrete and progressive investigative steps taken by the panel of judges resulted in significant progress to address the events of 28 September 2009. So where feasible, the ICC stands ready to share its expertise on legal and other matters to help domestic jurisdictions. The court has entered into partnership with the UN Office for Drugs and Crimes to support the strengthening of national capacities for witness protection and sentence enforcement. And other UN agencies and various regional and intergovernmental organizations can also play a role in facilitating efforts to address core international crimes. Such, uh, for instance, I can quote the, the mention the extraordinary African chambers in Senegal or the creation of the Special Criminal Court in the Central African Republic. So all these judicial entities depend on an enabling environment in which national authorities, governments, civil society, and international organizations play a role. This inter interdependent system of global justice is connected by common principles of international law, as well as shared values. Above all, the protection of human rights is a common goal for all of us. The ICC is not a human rights court as such, but of course human rights permeate everything that we do. Actually, uh, the, uh, in our own legal framework, the Rome Statute, the, uh, the court is mandated to apply human rights law and to apply its own law in a manner that, a con that is consistent with international recognized human rights. And many times, the events our court deals with are at the same time human rights violations as well as international crimes. At other times, there may be serious, even massive violations of human rights that nevertheless do not constitute genocide, crimes against humanity, or war crimes. But in any case, we need human rights mechanisms as well as international criminal justice in order to protect fundamental human values and to deter future crimes. In, in particular, the position of, of victims is of paramount importance for human rights mechanisms as well as criminal justice. Retribution is not enough. 
punishment is not good enough. We cannot focus on the perpetrators only. The ICC system recognizes that victims cannot be treated only as witnesses in criminal proceedings. The Rome Statute provides for the right to reparation for the harm suffered and the right to be an active part in the legal proceedings. And indeed, in the first 12 years of the court, thousands of victims have approached the court in the, in the different cases uh, be, uh, before the court in order to participate in the proceedings through their legal representatives and to seek reparations. And uh, the, the court has struggled to allow for this meaningful system to operate. Uh, we, uh, we are still looking into the system to make it more efficient and effective, uh, but it is an extremely important component of the ICC system. And uh, it is only now that the court will start testing the reparations part of that system. Because uh, until now, we have seen victims participating before uh, the court. Now it's time to see whether the court can indeed allow for meaningful reparation to victims. And of course, this will be done uh, and needs to be done in, uh, in cooperation of the, with the Trust Fund for Victims, which is an independent entity, but extremely important part of the system. So where is the court today? And already we have uh, said uh, several things. Well, let me, say, but let me start by saying that physically we are in a different place than we were before, because we have moved to the new premises of the court. Uh, we will have the official opening of this stunning new building on the 19th of April. And uh, it is important, it's not only important on a symbolic uh, uh, for a perspective, it is indeed important because we are moving into the permanent premises of a permanent court, but also because it is a purpose-built uh, uh, court. It is a functional uh, institution that will allow the court to function better in order that will allow the court to have multi simultaneous uh, trials in three courtrooms that are extremely functional and adva uh, techno technologically advanced. So it is, uh, uh, it is very important for the court and we are very happy uh, with, this, uh, with this new event. Uh, because indeed, um, physically we are in the new premises and judicially we are also in a new place. The, uh, the, the court enters into what is an unprecedented uh, judicial year uh, for the institution with uh, four uh, simultaneous trials going uh, on at the, uh, at the same time and uh, two more in the pipeline. Uh, in the coming days, we um, uh, expect to have the decisions on, uh, the, on confirmation of charges in two uh, cases, one related to the destruction of Timbuktu in Mali uh, first case at the court on related to the destruction of cultural property. And uh, the second one is the uh, um, confirmations of charges in the, um, re uh, with relation to Dominic Onwen of the Lord Resistance Army Uganda. These are uh, the hearings on confirmation charges took place uh, some weeks ago and now decisions are expected at any, at any time. Uh, if the charges are confirmed, this will add two more trials uh, to the court. Uh, the trials that are ongoing, as you know, one is the uh, Ruto and Sang trial in Kenya, where the prosecution case has concluded and a motion on uh, no case to answer is currently pending. Then there are the trials of Bosco Taganda of Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, that started in September last year, and Bagbo and Blegude Cote d'Ivoire that started in uh, January this year. And um, the, uh, we have just heard the, the judgment that has been issued yesterday on the, uh, on the Bemba case, and, uh, but there is uh, another Bemba al case going on first one at the court on obstruction of justice. So it's a trial that is not uh, a trial on core crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity, or war crimes, but uh, 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 cases uh, against uh, defendants on uh, obstruction of justice. So, um, so this takes um, a lot of, uh, that, the, the, that ex expands the workload of the court very much. As you can see, the ICC is extremely busy. 
And uh, after several years, the institution of institution building, the court is now operating at full speed. And there is every reason to believe that the workload is only going to increase further over the next years. With its increasing activities, the court encounters more and more challenges. As someone said to me some weeks ago, now that the court is serious, many more start to worry. Uh, so there are challenges for the court. Many, but I will not make a long list of challenges, but maybe we can encapsulate all the challenges in two areas. One is related to the efficiency and effectiveness of the court. The other one is about the legitimacy of the court. So let me uh, address these two major areas of challenges to tell you what we are doing and what more can be done. On efficiency and effectiveness, I have to say that uh, improving the efficiency and effectiveness of the court is the main priority that I have set for my term as president. The ICC must be able to provide and must be perceived as being able to provide high quality and independent justice in an independent, impartial and expeditious manner. Improving the efficiency and effectiveness of the court is essential to maintain and increase the confidence of the global community in the court and receive the cooperation that is necessary for our operations. I have engaged already with my fellow judges in a collective effort to take stock of the experience of the first 12 years, seek to improve the method of work, identify best judicial practices, and achieve greater harmonization across chambers and divisions. To the largest extent possible, we are trying to do this without seeking to amend the legal framework. Although we do recognize that at certain occasions, the slow pace of our proceedings are, is due to problems in the legal framework itself. So we have proposed already uh, some amendments to the rules and regulations of the court, not to the treaty, uh, but to the rules and regulations, but also to a large extent, we are trying to do this by simply reaching agreements on how best to proceed and to that effect, we have reflected these agreements in a public chambers manual that is publicized in the website. You can see some of the agreements that have been reached after 12 years in certain areas of the, uh, of the, uh, of the court, which is basically uh, the phases of the pre-trial proceedings and how we go from pre-trial to trial, which uh, we thought it was one of the uh, major problems in terms of um, uh, 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 slow proceedings. It was very much the pre-trial and a lot of duplication with the trial proceedings at the court. So we have tried to uh, address that through agreements among judges, identifying the problem and what could be done. Um, and of course, this is done with the judges. It's a collective effort, could not be done by one chamber on its own, but we are trying also together to also improve the methods of work in order to uh, also uh, save time and be more efficient. But also, the other organs of the court are, are uh, also committed to improve the efficiency of the institution as a whole. And, uh, in, in the, and uh, the, of the Office of the Prosecutor, for instance, they have now just released a new policy document on how on selection of cases, uh, which is one of the major, major uh, always questions and discussions is how the court uh, selects cases and situations where the, the Office of the Prosecutor is trying to provide more transparency uh, to, to this very uh, contentious uh, issue. So the three organs of the court in different ways are trying to improve the efficiency of the proceedings and the governance of the institution uh, as a whole. Now, um, of course, um, part of the problems of the court well, we can try to, to um, improve the internal management of the institution, but there are many things that affect efficiency and effectiveness that are beyond the control of the court itself. 
because as we all know, international tribunals and the International Criminal Court is no exception. We depend absolutely of the cooperation of external actors. And, uh, and of course, cooperation uh, has been forthcoming. That's why we have managed to do as much as we have done. But uh, cooperation sometimes is slow. Sometimes it's not forthcoming and, sometimes, and it's always, always extremely uh, important for the uh, efficiency of, of the court. Uh, the, at this point in time, for instance, 13 arrest warrants of the court are outstanding uh, and some for more than a decade. Uh, I, I mentioned Dominique Ongwen. The charges uh, uh, may be confirmed uh, in the coming weeks or not, but the confirmation hearing had taken place. Uh, but um, this is a recent event of a person against whom an arrest warrant had been pending for 10 years. Actually, I think it's one of the best, one of the first arrest warrants uh, issued by the court. So only 10 years later, we have managed to uh, uh, have the person trans transferred to, to the court. So, and 13 arrest warrants are outstanding. We also need um, the cooperation of all states, but also state parties and non-parties and we need even more than its obligation under the treaty. We need more states to enter into voluntary agreements with the court on witness relocation, enforcement of sentences, hosting suspects or accused on provisional release, and accepted acquitted persons. Uh, it's uh, easier for the court to have states accepting convicted persons. We need also states to accept acquitted persons, a persons that may be also, as I said, under interim release uh, pending trial. And then sometimes we cannot simply release persons, not because the person deserves to be detained, but because we cannot find a state that accepts to have that person. So that may lead the court to enter into what is basically a violation of human rights unless we, have, we can solve it uh, through cooperation. And of course, we need better and faster action from states in the tracing, seizing, and freezing of assets. That's an extremely important matter as well uh, because some of our detainees are being treated as indigents uh, and, uh, and being provided legal aid because we cannot freeze or seize their assets. But also freezing and seizing assets is extremely important for uh, the purpose of reparations to victims. So this is an extremely uh, important area. So um, we need swift and full cooperation to access to evidence, of course, in order to have better investigations. So improving the efficiency and effectiveness of the court is in part a task for the court, and we are trying to do our best to do that part but is another part is, of course, we need cooperation from states. And the two are linked. We hope that if we show that we can uh, deliver a better uh, justice, we also encourage states to provide and, not, and, and other entities to provide more, more um, cooperation. Now, let me uh, go into the final part of my uh, statement, and I think I'm going already uh, too, too lengthy, and I want to give time for questions and a dialogue, but I need to address the uh, huge challenge of legitimacy of the court. Um, and, uh, of course, the, uh, the court uh, has been under a lot of criticism, and here we are going, and, and this symposium is going to be discussing uh, the, uh, the relations between the court and Africa, uh, uh, and of course uh, the, uh, the, the, the way the court is perceived is extremely important. We need, uh, the court has time, is being criticized, for instance, of uh, uh, applying selective justice, of targeting uh, a region, uh, a particular region. Well, this type of uh, criticism uh, may affect the legitimacy of the court. We need to address it. And first of all, we need to recall that the court is a treaty body. So the court can only operate within the parameters of the treaty. And within these parameters, the court at this point in time cannot intervene in any situation uh, that would uh, justify its attention. Because, simply because we have no jurisdiction. Hmm? The, uh, the court uh, can, uh, has a global mandate, but has not yet universal participation. That means that uh, crimes may be committed 
that would deserve the attention of the court that no one is addressing. There's no uh, solution through domestic uh, mechanisms and still the court cannot reach these, uh, these type of crimes because they are outside the jurisdiction of the court. They are committed in uh, territories that are outside the jurisdiction of the institution. And you know well that uh, the only way for the court to have uh, jurisdiction on situations that are not within uh, the parameters of the treaty is through Security Council referrals. And we have had two referrals of the Council in the situations in Darfur and, uh, and Libya, um, but uh, this is not an answer to the problem and it's not an answer of the problem of uh, selective justice because the Security Council is also is a political actor. So we cannot expect uh, the same treatment in all situations. So the, this can only happen uh, by uh, enhancing the uh, participation in the treaty so the court can indeed uh, uh, address all situations in an independent way without depending on the referrals of uh, external actors. And that, uh, that is why universality the, 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 is the main challenge for the court and uh, the battle of all battles. We need to expand the uh, participation in the treaty. So um, we have had um, a, a late, um, the latest um, ratification. We have now 124 state parties. El Salvador joined the court some weeks ago.